I'm excited what God has to close us out with tonight. Bear with me a little bit tonight. I've been dealing with some voice issues. So we may have to hack our way through this one, but we'll do whatever we have to do uh, to get it out tonight. We got to go back to 1 John one last time. Tonight we'll close the book on our real love series that we've been in over the past few weeks. And here's what I hope. I hope that you've begun to know and to believe the love that God has for you. That's what John said for these believers that we saw at the beginning when we started this. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. And so that's my hope for you guys. That's my prayer for you guys is that over the past few weeks or maybe even tonight is the night where you come to that realization where you know and believe the love that God has for you. Like Natalie was talking about earlier, he doesn't love us because of any worth that we have or because of anything that we have done to deserve that or to earn that. He loves us because that's who he is. John says God is love. And he loved us so much that even in our sin, Christ would die for us so that we could come to know him in an intimate and personal relationship. And it's so funny you mentioned what other people believe in so many other religions in the world, so many other paths that can be taken, so many other teachings out there, so many other claims of this is how you gain entrance into heaven or eternal life or whatever it may be. How do we sort out the true from the false? But the reality is, if you look amongst all those other things, there is no other God except Yahweh that says, I desire a personal relationship with you. No other God makes that claim. Because no other God is love, like our God is love. So I hope and pray that you guys have come to know and believe the love that God has for you, that only in him is real love found and experienced. Don't let this world fool you with a fake love. Scripture talks a lot about love. God's love for us, the way we are supposed to love the world and each other and the things that we should love, but there are also things that God warns us in his word to not love. So tonight is going to be more about something that we shouldn't love instead of the things that we are to love. And it's going to sound and feel a little backwards at first. So let's check it out. First John chapter 2, we're going to pick up in verse 15 where John writes to the believers and he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes, and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. We're going to finish this deal on the subject of not loving the world. As followers of Jesus, we are not to love the world. Now, wait a minute. That sounds a little backwards, Trey. I thought we were supposed to love the world. I thought we're supposed to have a love for this world around us. I mean, John 3, 16, right? Like God so loved the world that he gave his son. So I thought we're supposed to love the world. Now you're telling me that I'm not supposed to love the world. So let's clarify what we mean by this. So here's the first thing I want to show you tonight is that this is a love-hate relationship. It's a love-hate relationship. So you go back in verse 15. Let's review it again. John says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We are absolutely called to love the people of this world and to love the creation that fills our world. You are 100% correct in that. Yes, God loves the world. He sent his son to die for everyone, all the people who have lived, who are living, and who will live. Christ came to die for them sent by the love of the Father. God loves the world. He loves its people. He loves the world in the fact that it is his creation, the work of his hands, that he fashioned and put together and set in order exactly how he desired it to be. And we, as followers of his, are to love 
people and to love his creation in the same manner. But listen to me. Loving the people and the creation that is our world is different than loving the things of this world. There is a distinction that is very clear between those two. And so we see that John clearly warns us against loving the world in a wrong way. So let's understand what we mean by the word world in this instance. In this case, as John is writing to these believers, as we're taking this in tonight from God's word, the word world doesn't mean as in its people or the creation that makes it up. In this instance, we mean world as in the worldly systems and devices that are at work within this world that are directly and clearly opposed to God and his word. That's what we mean in this context of not loving the world. And that's the clear distinction that God makes for those of us as his followers to not love those things. We are not to love this world and its system and its devices that are very clearly set against God and his glory and his holiness. This is the kind of world that John later says in chapter 5, verse 19 of the same book that we're in, that this world lies in the power of the evil one. The world that Jesus described in John 12, 31, if you want to earmark that, is being ruled by the devil. So Jesus makes it clear that this world that we are part of, this worldly system, this world and its devices are being ruled by the devil. So God in his sovereignty has allowed the devil a certain amount of free reign and power to reign over this present world that we live in. Now, listen to me. I know it can be a little strange. He only exercises the amount of authority that God allows him to have. That's why ultimately he is a defeated foe. And one day when Christ returns, his demise will be sealed. But for the time being, he is allowed a certain extent of power to wreak havoc upon this earth. This is the kind of world and the things that we find in it that we don't love, that God says we are actually to hate. And so there exists for those of us who know Christ this love-hate relationship with the world. We love the world in the sense that we love the people of this world. We love the souls of this world. We love the creation of this world and the things that God put in it. But we hate it in the sense that it is directly opposed against God in its systems, in its devices, in the things that it tempts us with. To, to live out in an ungodly, unholy, unrighteous way. Psalm 97.10 says this, You who love the world, or you who love the Lord, hate evil. Love, hate. Romans 12.9 says, Abhor what is evil. Hold fast, or love, what is good. Hate, love. Love, Hate. So we need to understand the proper context of the love that we are supposed to have for this world around us. So we love the souls of this world, but we hate the systems of this world because they're not for us. And when we enter into a relationship with Christ, the old is past, the new has come, which means there is a new system that we live by and it does not belong to this temporal world. It belongs to our eternal Father and the life that he has called us and set us into to live in. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty here for a moment because I want to talk to the saints in the room, those of us who have given our lives to Jesus. Let's talk for just a second. I feel like this is one of these kind of sit-down talks. All of us who have professed Christ need to stop walking the line of loving things that God has told us to stay away from. Now, I did not say you guys need to stop doing that. I said all of us, myself included, need to stop walking so closely to the line that God says we are to stay away from. Now, this is why we're going to have this sit-down talk, because 
we're going to take our we're going to take our holy clothes off for a minute and be real. When I say that, don't for one second look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. What do you mean, Dre? What line are you talking about? You know exactly the lines that I'm talking about. You know exactly the things that I'm talking about that God has told you to stay away from that you are walking way too closely to. And it's high time that we as the body of Christ start living as the body of Christ. Stop entertaining. Stop walking closely to the things that he has told us to stay away from and put a very noticeable and distinct gap between a former way of living and a newer way of living. Because here's the truth of the matter. If you walk in the line, there are points where you're crossing the line. You know how I know that? Because I've walked the line. <laughs> And if you walk it closely long enough, eventually you'll just take a step across it. And you come back over. And then a little bit later, you might cross it again. Then you'll come back over. And we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So let's stop trying to justify it. You might not want to call it loving, but you're flirting. You're flirting with things that God has obviously told you to keep your distance from. Perhaps the church has a little more love for the things of the world than we do hatred for them. Here's some advice, some life advice. I've always found that until my hatred of a sin eclipses the love I have for that sin, I'll continue to go back to that sin. That's why... God in his word says, you who love the Lord hate evil. Because until that hatred eclipses the love that you have for that sin, you will continue to go back to that sin. So some of you really need to hear this tonight because you've got a sin struggle in your life that you have battled for 5, 10, 15 years, and you're wondering why you can't find freedom from that thing. Well, let's just take a moment of honesty and be real and say the real reason why I don't have freedom from that thing is because I love it still just a little bit more than I hate it. And so I keep going back to it. As the people of God, there needs to be a hatred in our hearts for the things that we know cost Christ to be crucified for. What John follows with next should check us very pointedly along these lines. Listen to what he says. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's a scary phrase. Or at least it should be. For those who find ourselves to still have a love for the things of this world stowed away in our heart. James put it this way in James chapter 4, verse 4. He says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. It's a love-hate relationship. We love the world as God loves the world, but we hate the world as it opposes God. Love, hate. Hate, love. We're not called to love this world. Let's point out something else that's important tonight. I think this is going to be good. I think y'all are going to enjoy this. How many of you know the devil's a liar? Turn to somebody beside you and tell them the devil's a liar. How many of you like exposing the lies of the devil? I like exposing the lies of the devil. Every lie we expose, listen, every lie that you can expose with the truth of Scripture is a weapon he just lost. So look at this. Look, he's, he's, got, a, he's got a toxic love potion that he uses. Since we're on the topic of love for the past few weeks, the devil's got a love potion. And I'm going to show you what he uses 
to make it with. You need to be aware that the world and its ruler, which is the devil, is quite cunning. And because he doesn't love God, he doesn't want you to either. So he's put together a powerful blend of things to tempt you with, to hopefully cause you to fall into what he would say is a better life for you to live. It's his love potion, and it's a good one. It's strong. And so John says in the world, you'll find three specific things. Go back and look at verse 16. He says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So John shows us these three specific things, and these are the three ingredients that the devil uses to make his love potion with. The first is the desires of the flesh. So let's talk about what these things are. These desires are anything that appeal to our fallen sinful nature. Our flesh, as the Bible describes it, is that physical side of us, that physical nature of us that is born into sin. The reality that all of us, because of what took place in the garden, that we have been born into, that fleshly nature, that sinful nature that is just by default inclined to rebel against the authority that is to reign over our lives, that being God himself. So this is the fleshly side of us. Everybody, everybody in this room has God-given physical desires that are of themselves good things. I'll give you some examples. Everybody in here has a desire to eat. That is a physical God-given desire that he gave to each and every one of us to have a desire to eat. Every single one of us in here have a desire to drink. My desire is killing me right now. My throat is so scratchy, like, I don't know if we're going to make it or not. Everybody in here has a desire to drink when they get thirsty. That is a physical desire that God has given. Everybody in here has a desire to sleep. Amen? How many of y'all found next level on your nap life when you got into college? Like naps used to be the thing that you hated until you got to college life, and all of a sudden it's like, man, I'm napping every opportunity I get. Everybody in here has a natural physical desire to sleep when we get tired. God gave us a desire to have sex. (gasps) Oh, my God. You said sex at church. Oh, my gosh. It is a God-given desire. I'm going to try not to get on a soapbox with this because this is a whole, whole other series. God created and ordained sex, not this world. And he created it as good. He gave it boundaries. And we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. All of us have desires. Those things aren't evil. None of those things are things to hate. But here's how the devil will mix the potion up. He'll take hunger, and he'll turn it into gluttony. He'll take thirst, he'll turn it into drunkenness. He'll take sleep, he'll turn it into laziness. He'll take sex, he'll turn it into immorality. You see the mix-up? Those things are sinful and what God has told us to take no part in. So the devil takes things that are good. Listen, here's the key. The devil takes things that are good and tempts us to use them in forbidden ways. That's the danger of the potion. But he doesn't just do it with our flesh John points out that he does it with the eyes, too. So there's the desires of the flesh, but then there's the desires of the eyes, the second ingredient in the potion. These desires appeal to what we see as satisfying or gratifying to our minds. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says something that's really powerful and profound and a truth that I think a lot of times we overlook. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Sometimes I think we forget the eyes are doors into our minds and our souls. 
And the things that you allow to enter into those things ultimately affect how you live unto God. And so we can go back to the Ten Commandment days when God handed those down to Moses, and one of the things that he inscribed on there was, do not covet. So covetousness takes place when our eyes fall on something that we don't have, but we begin to want in sinful ways. And so we pursue that. <laughs> and we do whatever we can to gain that thing, that possession, whatever it may be, into our lives with wrong reasons. So the devil knows this, so he will play on those desires and on that sense. He will tempt you in this way and say, okay, you want to give your life to Jesus? That's fine. But doesn't this life look a little better? You want this relationship? That's fine. But wouldn't this relationship look a, a little better and a little more freeing if you experienced it in this way? Abram, my man. <clears throat> All right, we got to take a time out. So he'll, he'll take this and he'll say, okay, Jesus says life abundant. I get that. But what about this freedom you'd have with me? What about all the things that he says you can't do or you can't have or you can't experience? And the devil will begin to put these things in front of you in your line of sight to try to tempt those desires in that way. Here, see, here's the thing. This is why I love the Word of God, because He warns us about all this stuff. God, God doesn't leave us in the battle unprepared or without weapons. And so this is why we're told to fix our eyes not on what is seen and to set our minds on things above. So check it out. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, We look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are or eternal. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. So God says, if you, if you will do this, you won't fall into that trap. You won't fall into that temptation because he knows how the devil plays the game. He knows the ingredients of the potion, and he says, if he can get you to look at these things, if you can look at the temporal, if you can look at the things that are seen, And he can get you to fall into a love that you are not to have for the things of this world. But there's one more thing, one more ingredient. You go back and look at what John says. He says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Pride of life, last ingredient. This part of the potion appeals to our desire to be somebody. To attain to a certain level of notoriety. This is the part of the potion that persuades people to buy houses or cars or clothes or vacations they can't afford. Why? Because of a prideful appearance. So other people might look at our lives and desire what we have or think that we can live above a means that we can't really live at on our own, this is the pride of life. This is, this is the keeping up with the Joneses kind of side of things that you guys may not necessarily be tempted with as much right now. But when you move on to your next season of life and your peers and your friends, they're getting married, they're getting jobs, they're buying houses, they're buying cars, they're doing whatever. These are the things that you begin to be tempted with. Why? Because you want to look like everybody else around you. You want to have the things everybody else has around you. And so the devil will tempt you to say, well, go and get those things. Go and do those things. You'll be somebody. You can have that notoriety. You can have that status. You can have that label, whatever it may be. Whatever will cause you to look impressive, go and get those things. You know what that is? That's self-glorification. And you want to know who was the originator of self-glorification? The devil. He desired a glory that exceeded God. And that's why he fell. And when he fell, he fell with a term that we now have called pride. King Solomon is the epitome of this. 
Go read about Solomon in Ecclesiastes. He said, anything my eyes wanted or my mind thought about, I went and got it for myself. Whatever I wanted. Whatever I desired. Solomon didn't have a thought pop into his mind of something that he wanted that he didn't go and get for himself. He loved the attention. He loved having kings and queens and foreign dignitaries walk into his house and marvel at the things that he had. He loved everything about that. But read it into the last chapter and see how it ended for him. All of these things, desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, the pride of life, all of these things mixed together make up a concoction that is so toxic for us to take in. Let me show you the perfect example of how this played out. You may not have even known it, even though you've read it time and time again. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, so here's what you need to understand. Like This potion is so deadly because the devil has been mixing it together for a long time and he has perfected it. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, here's the key. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Do you see what just happened? Satan slinks his way into the garden, begins to question the words and the commands of God and the life that he had laid out for Adam and Eve in perfection, mixes together the potion, passes it over to Eve, and instantly sinks her into it. Watch, just in case you haven't, let me make it perfectly clear. If you go back to verse 6, when a woman saw that the tree was good for food, desired of the flesh, and that it was a delight to the eyes, desires of the eyes, and was desired to make one wise, pride of life. God doesn't want you to eat that because he knows then you'll become like him. This is an age-old potion. That is very, very effective in how it poisons the life of people. But you know the thing about it is, after he made all those promises, none of it proved to bring about what was promised. That's the poison of the potion. The devil will make all kinds of promises that never prove themselves to be true. None of those things took place for Adam and Eve. Not one single thing that the devil said would come about came about. It was all lie. It was all fabricated. You know what it was? It was fake. It wasn't real. How many of you are Harry Potter fans? All right, Harry Potter. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Harry and Ron go to potions class. And there's old Slughorn in there, and he's mixed up some potions, and he's asking the class if anybody knows what these are. And so Hermione, you know, obliges, and she's explaining what each potion is. And in the midst of the lineup is what? A love potion. And so Hermione walks up to the love potion, and you can tell, like, just the effects of smelling it are already having an effect on her. And she's explaining how It's believed that the potion appeals to what attracts each person. And so there are specific things that she finds attractive. 
And as she gets closer to the potion, those things begin to take effect on her. And so she backs away, and even there's like three or four other girls in the room, they start kind of like love drunk walking up to it. And the professor makes the remark that this potion, it doesn't create actual love. That would be impossible. But it does cause powerful infatuation or obsession. For that reason, as he's putting the lid back on it, he says, it is probably the most dangerous potion in this room. This potion that the devil uses works in the same way. Listen to me, it does not cause real love. It just leads you into an infatuation or obsession of the things of this world, and it will eventually wear off because it is not real. In the moment, sure, it feels amazing. In the moment, it's a thrill. In the moment, it's a rush. In the moment, it's euphoric, but it will always fade away. That's why those who are in the world always have to keep going back to the world because there is no fulfillment in the world. These things, John says, are not from the Father. And if it's not from Him, let me tell you something straight up. It's not real. The fulfillment, the satisfaction, the pleasure, the entertainment, the notoriety, the temporary glory, none of it's real. Stop falling in love with what is false and realize the mix of this phony potion that the devil is feeding into so many people's lives inside of the church. Now keep in mind, please keep in mind, that John, as he is saying these things, is speaking them to believers. He's saying, you guys need to stop drinking the devil's Kool-Aid because it's causing you to fall in love with things that we are not to love. One last thing. One last reason why we're not to love the world. Because this is a love that is destined to die. Verse 17, John says, The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. John says this world is passing away along with its desires. And so this worldly system that's in place, that's set up in opposition to God and who He is, is in the active process of dying and will eventually pass into oblivion. Which means that all the things that it offers and tempts you to fall in love with are one day going to die along with it. Listen, no one wants to invest their funds into an asset that is decaying. That's a bad business decision. Would you agree? So why invest your life into a world that is doing the same? That's a poor personal decision. Hebrews eleven thirteen 13 says that, that we are to be strangers and live as exiles on this earth. This is not somewhere we're to be comfortable. This is not somewhere we're supposed to be invested in. In the same way, 1 Corinthians 7, 31 says that the present form of this world is passing away. So the things of this world are on their way out the door. And the funny thing is, you know, people of different beliefs, people of different faiths, people of different religions, whatever, we disagree on a lot of things. Absolutely. But I find it funny how everyone, regardless of what you believe or who you believe in or how you believe in it, regardless of all those things, it's funny how everyone seems to agree that one day this is all going to be over. You know why? Because one day it is. And just in the same way that God has placed within each soul an innate knowledge, whether we want to admit it or not, of who He is, I think He has also placed within us an innate knowledge that one day this stuff is no longer going to be like it is anymore. It's going to come to an end. The Bible tells us that all these former things will pass away. But there's a second clause to that where God continues saying this, but I will make all things new. There's a second part to what John said also. He said this world is dying and along with it is desires, but Whoever does the will of the Father will abide forever. Those of us in Christ will abide forever with Him in a place that will never pass away. 
with an eternal glory and a heavenly system that will never fade. So this is why, men and women of God, we can't love the world because we're not of it. And this love and whatever love you may have for it, it's going to die. It's going to pass away. It's going to be done away with completely and all things will be made new. And it's a glorious truth to know when we're in Christ that the way things are isn't always how they're going to be. And God says, behold, I, I will wipe away the former things and I will make all things new. And we'll be there with him. You know, there will be a day where we'll be in a place where there is no more pain, where there is no more sorrow, there's no more tears, no more death, no more sickness, no more flesh, no more sin, no more trials, no more hardships, no more tribulations. None of those things are going to exist anymore. We will be in perfected glory with our Savior. I can't even imagine. But I can't wait. And I'm telling you guys, like, this world has nothing for you. The ruler of this world, the devil, he has nothing for you. You know, he hadn't sacrificed for you one single time. Not once. And yet he wants to tell you what real life is and how it's found and how it can be experienced. This world and its promises, they'll never endure. But the promises of our Lord and Savior They'll be eternally fulfilled. And so as we finish up tonight, just plain and simple, if you're a believer and you're struggling with loving the things of this world, walk away from that junk. Get away from that garbage. Can I encourage you with something tonight? To stop sipping on the love potion of the devil and remember what that eternal life that sprung up from the well of Christ tasted like. Be satisfied with it. But if you're here tonight and you've never experienced real love because you've never experienced Jesus, you've never given your life to him, some of you may be here for the first time tonight and this is all new to you and you had no idea that Jesus has done such a thing for you that you even needed it. And you've got questions we want to answer them. But I think some of you here tonight and you've been here all semester and you've heard about the love that God has for you. We've talked about the gospel time and time again and you have fought off the Spirit of God and his conviction upon your heart time and time again this semester. He has made your feet feel like concrete every time you have tried to take a step towards someone to ask them how you can know Jesus. It's the last thing he wants you to know and experience. But listen, take heart in knowing that there are people sitting in this room tonight who broke that hold on their life of the enemy and have experienced everlasting, eternal, new life in Christ. And every single one of them would testify to you that that first step, as hard as it may be, is the greatest one that you'll ever take. Hey, this is Trey Mitchell, college and young adult pastor. I just wanted to say thank you for listening. It's our prayer that God uses these messages in a way that challenge and encourage you to live for His glory. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus as your Savior, we would love to help you with making that decision. Just reach out to us through our webpage at underwoodbaptist.org.
Be sure to check back in with us next week as we again encounter God through his word here at Life.